I, of course, want to join the chorus of everyone who's been thanking Francis, Sarah, and Betsy for putting this all on. Um, so this has been wonderful. We're only on, you know, not even through the first whole day. Um, I also want to give you guys a little bit of background about where I'm teaching. Um, I'm at Texas State University, which is uh, the other large public school in Texas. Uh, we are in San Marcos, and we are 38,000 students. Uh, we are also a Hispanic-serving institution, which means that we're actually a minority-majority campus. Um, so most of our students are um, Hispanic or um, another minority. Uh, and so I actually have a lot of Vietnamese American students who I'll talk about. Um, and as I've talked about in another presentation that Rachel Pang helped to organize, uh, the, at Sexor, which is our an American Academy of Religion, the Southeast Asian kind of community, uh, I didn't expect that kind of diversity when I came to Texas. We have a lot of ideas about what Texas and the South is like in our head. Um, and I actually, had this had got me thinking that I think that we carry those ideas into our classrooms. Um, so the major thrust of this presentation is that the makeup of our universities, colleges, and other institutions of higher learning is changing, but our pedagogy is not. In teaching Buddhism, we continue to rehash what is a largely unchanged syllabus and a fairly standard set of canonical texts. The specific textbooks may have been updated, but the narrative trajectory of Buddhist history that dominates our classrooms has not. Despite our attempts to modernize our syllabi with small addendums or side quests like popular Buddhism, lay Buddhism, or ritual Buddhism, our overall model remains a fairly standard historical narrative of Buddhism beginning in India, developing Mahayana ideas, spreading to China, Japan, and Tibet, and growing today among American society. Furthermore, we present this narrative to our students using almost exclusively textual and written materials. In our slavish repetition of this narrative and our largely unquestioned reliance on texts, we are failing our students by not only leaving them unprepared to engage with actual living Buddhists and the actual living Buddhist tradition, but also by designing our courses around an imagined student who no longer is the norm in many of our classrooms. All of this ultimately reinforces a specific presentation of the Buddhist tradition that has its roots in the world religions paradigm and is as much a fiction as a fact. So I always like to just insert some blank slides so you listen to me and not read my slide. So when we begin designing the syllabi and activities for our Buddhism classrooms, we generally take a moment to imagine the types of students we will encounter. I think I speak for many of us when I say we probably imagine students who have read Jack Kerouac in high school, who envision Buddhism as a contemplative tradition based largely or even entirely around the development of mindfulness and contemplation, and who are, we can say, culturally coded as white, uh, or more broadly speaking, Euro-American. And we know, of course, that our classrooms are different now and increasingly diverse, and especially at Texas State University or other large public universities, but the narrative trajectory of Buddhism and the Buddhist content that we highlight continues to speak to this largely white perception of Buddhism. These imagined students, for many of us, are reflections of the types of students we were, students for whom Buddhism represented a rebellion against a predominant Christian culture, an extension of our fascination with the mystic East, and a means to express a small rebellion against capitalism and the culture of American consumerism. The term, imagined student, is not my own. It was coined by Brett Asaki in a forum we wrote together for the journal Teaching Theology and Religion, published by the Wabash Center. But it speaks evocatively to the ex expectations we bring into the classroom because these non-existent yet omnipresent imagined students leave their mark on our syllabi. While we certainly acknowledge that there will likely be students outside these parameters coming to our classrooms, we generally will sometimes consider them the exception rather than the rule. These assumptions we bring to the classroom about our students do not arise from nowhere. Rather, they reflect a specific conception of Buddhism as a primarily philosophical tradition that one can understand apart from its cultural manifestations. We generally assume our students have this conception of Buddhism because this is how Euro-Americans have conceptualized the Buddhist tradition for centuries. Well, Eva Pascal, Urs App, and others have noted that Catholic missionaries in Asia experienced living reflections of Buddhism and identified them as parts of a singular tradition, for the vast majority of Euro-Americans who were not living and working in Asia, their first encounters with Buddhism were primarily textual. Such early interlocutors of the tradition, therefore, generally privileged the textual manifestations of Buddhism as primary 
and the lived realities of Buddhists as cultural denigrations of the once pristine tradition. As the field of religious studies developed, this textual foundation provided the underpinnings of what has been called the world religions paradigm that ultimately privileged certain expressions of Buddhist practice as authentic or primary over others. Central to this paradigm was the identification of those things clearly arising from the doctrinal and philosophical history of India as the heart of the world religion of Buddhism. In contrast, specific cultural practices uh, developed outside of institutional settings were subsequently relegated to folk practice or to folk piety. This distinction has not only had academic effects, but political ones as well, as Melody pointed out when we're talking about sort of this reinforcement of the European colonial endeavor across Asia. Now, while I'm sure that my brief restatement of the history is not new for most of those in the, in the room, our classrooms still fundamentally reflect this world religions paradigm through their focus on a specific set of canonical textual materials as normative. Our inclusion of sections on popular Buddhism or the Buddhist practices found in specific countries attempts to address this issue by complicating the nature of Buddhism. However, I would argue that by identifying certain things as adjective plus Buddhism rather than simply Buddhism, we continue to communicate to our students a certain ideal of what constitutes normative Buddhism. Oh, I have a couple more I forgot about. So, this conception of normative Buddhism is enhanced by our decision to focus instruction both inside and outside the classroom on textual materials largely disembodied from the culture that surround them. So through this, our students learn that it is texts that are important that are the heart of Buddhism, not practice. I would argue this reflection of Buddhism that we create disproportionately affects those students that we did not imagine. Those minority students who experience Buddhism, the Buddha, and Buddhist practices in ways largely removed from this history of Euro-American encounters. By some estimates, minority students account for nearly 50% of undergraduates today, but this has by and large had little effect on our pedagogy. Perhaps in an effort to support the life of the mind that is ideally the foundation of higher education, we often overlook the embodied realities of our minority students, and this ultimately translates to treating those students as culturally coded white. In my own experience at Texas State University, I often teach second generation Vietnamese American students who identify their home religious tradition as Buddhism. However, they have described to me feeling alienated from the material, finding little that speaks to their experience of the tradition. I've also taught several students who make offerings to the Buddha as part of the Santeria tradition and question why we don't study that as an American incarnation of Buddhism, as in fact an offering to the Buddha and arguably not very different from what many more traditionally identified Buddhists do as part of their religious practice. While I am not arguing that we should only teach a Buddhist tradition that students can readily identify as their own, we need to acknowledge that the, that the decisions that guide our syllabi and the students we imagine coming into our classrooms affects how our actual students feel. So I want to spend the rest of my presentation exploring how we as educators can try to break our classrooms free of the world religion religions paradigm and welcome minority students into the academic study of Buddhism. While I don't believe that these few strategies discussed are going to fix the problem entirely, um, nor do I want this to be the final word on the subject, I hope that this can begin a conversation where we can talk about and brainstorm strategies through the rest of this weekend. And I will acknowledge that a lot of the times our focus on texts is a reaction to where our classrooms are located. Not everyone teaches in an in urban setting or in a community that has a large Buddhist population nearby. Um, however, in an age of digital media where YouTube, Instagram, and other online content abound, we have a much better array of tools to teach Buddhism than our forebears did. So as a result, I've designed several digital ethnography projects where students explore videos and photographs taken by witnesses to Buddhist practice on the ground and analyze them using information from our courses. So when I'm doing this in class, I generally have us do a few together as a class so we can kind of get practice at it. Then they break into small groups and we'll do them. And then eventually they do become classroom assessments. Um, so I thought we'd kind of go over the outlines of some of them. I can show you some things I have experimented with. Uh, and we can see what you guys think of them. So one assignment that has been really popular with my students is what I call insta-ethnography. So while I usually don't allow electronics in my classrooms, I do have them bring them for this day. And so after having my students read the chapter on the sutra on the merit of bathing the Buddha um, from Don Lopez's Buddhism in Practice, I pull up Instagram on my classroom projector and we search for the hashtag bathing the Buddha. So I want us to do this together. So here we are, 
on Instagram. No, I don't need to log into Instagram. You don't need to see my posts. <laughs> okay, so here we are. So looking through this, we get a really cool kind of on the ground depiction of what different people have hashtagged as baiting the Buddha. And when I do this with my students, we generally will kind of I'll let them sort of guide this. So they might be like, click on that one. I want to see what that one says. Um, kind of go down, most recent. So this one's kind of interesting. I like this one a lot. So this one's kind of cool um, because here this is a woman. So in Malaysia, talking about a Tibetan Buddhist tradition there happening um, and uh, talking about the monks coming to Malaysia from Nepal. So you get this really cool sense of transnational Buddhism in a way that just saying Tibetan Buddhism or Korean Buddhism doesn't give you access to. Um, so that she's really fun to look at. Um, I was like this one, because um, here we have a Euro-American child or a white child celebrating Thai New Year. Um, this gives us as a class the opportunity to talk a lot about kind of white tourism in Asia and uh, the kind of participation of um, you know, white individuals traveling in Asia in Buddhist spaces. Uh, so after about 10 minutes, we use this as the kind of basis of our discussion. Um, and some cool themes that develop out of kind of students looking through this. Um, as I said, particularly popular topics include the production of merit and karma um, and kind of how karma works. Uh, the radically transnational, transnational nature of the Buddhist world becomes a, a, a talked about a lot as does this kind of white tourism in Asia and what do you do with kind of tourists in sacred Buddhist spaces. Um, well, it might be tempting to plan this exercise in a later unit on Buddhist festivals or devotional Buddhism. I most recently experimented with putting it on the second day of class. We discussed the concept of karma and the foundational role it plays in Buddhist life. This decision not only allowed me to bypass categories like devotional Buddhism altogether, but also provide a graceful lead into the life story of the Buddha. Um, the other kind of cool thing that you can do with this is it becomes, you know, just the way that texts intertextual, uh, there's like intertextuality between texts, so it is with Instagram, because you can go from hashtag to hashtag to hashtag and see how the people who are participating in this kind of, I won't say a Buddhist space, we don't know if everyone on here is a Buddhist, but this how people kind of, what they link together. Um, so it kind of goes see Thai culture, and then we can explore hashtags related to that. And then that gives us more opportunity to talk about the hospitality industry in <laughs> Thailand. <laughs> Things like that. So. Da -da -da. Then eventually, I'm just going to put that down there. Excellent. So related to this insta-ethnography exercise is another form of digital ethnography based on YouTube videos. So similar to the previous exercise, we watch a YouTube video as a class and we analyze it. Um, so I particularly like, I have a cool video that I like to use here. Of, a, of people making offerings. That was weird. So usually goes on a little bit longer, but it's a video of a Thai family making offerings to monks. Um, this also gives us the chance to talk about material culture um, because we have, we, we have these kind of photographs of these new robes, these kind of like care packages that people buy for the monks in their life. Um, and so this gives students a chance to think about are those sacred crackers in there? Are they sacred because they're being given to a monk? Um, and so why? Because I, when I was in Thailand, I tell a story about how I tried to buy one of those for myself uh, and they wouldn't let me have it. Um, so talk about kind of how these crack, like, when did the crackers become sacred only for monks? Um, so it also gives us the opportunity to talk about the kind of interpenetration of the monastic and the non-monastic communities. Um, another video I use for this, so we're going to go back to YouTube. Actually, I think I'm going to just... Um, so we're going to watch kind of parts of this video because we don't have time to watch all of it. Hey guys, this is Sarah with Dose of Diversity. On so this is where she's touring a Buddhist temple in Houston. And so what's kind of cool about this, and we'll kind of watch certain parts of it, is that it really presents this opportunity to talk about the, kind of, the construction of Buddhism and Taoism as separate traditions. Same way. 
Today we're at the Kwan D Temple here in downtown Houston, and we're going to give you guys a great greet um, and a, a little free tour, give you a flavor of what a Houston greet is like. All right, so come along with us. This is Temple. Kwan D Temple. Kwan D Temple, the man in the middle is Kwan D. The temple, everybody come here, bow down the Kwan Gong Buddha, and the Jeju, and it shall be good luck for you. In order for God to know that we're here, I'm going to jump or we forward. Like incense, so, uh, in the interest of time, if we want, if we have a wish, yes. you want to know, you want to know something, you want to know something. It's like a fortune. Okay, it's like a fortune. Yeah. But for a lot of you guys that might be familiar, those are practices usually done in Taoist temples today. Um, so watching this gives us the opportunity to talk about um, kind of the, the way that in Chinese culture, Buddhism and Taoism are often, um, and are often not as separate as we like to think of them in Western kind of Euro-American ideas, but also especially as the Vietnamese American population and the Chinese American population came to, uh, came to America, they didn't have enough patrons to support two separate temples. Uh, it can also be fun to look at the actual comments. So if you go down, you see here from BTV Lee, it is not a Buddhist temple. It is a Taoist temple with superstitious teachings that have nothing to do with Buddhism. Just teachings. So this is a great opportunity to talk to students about kind of the second order, the second kind of order way nature of this idea of Buddhism um, and this idea of like authentic versus unauthentic Buddhism. Um, Beyond these more evidently Buddhist videos, I also like to have students watch a video of a Santeria practitioner named Liat Sisi. Uh, so let me pull that up here. So for those of you who might not be familiar, Santeria is a Cuban-American uh, tradition um, that uh, is kind of related to voodoo or vado um, that's practiced in Louisiana. And the Buddha has an important role in it. Our faces reflect who we are in each emotion and every touch. Your skip on that. Hola, mis amores, el día de hoy te vengo a enseñar qué actividad de Buda es dar a este personaje tan, tan poderoso que tenemos en casa o también los tenemos en los negocios. ¿Cómo te sirve? Pues de la siguiente manera. Cuando siempre encuentras un Buda, agua florida nunca debe faltar en tu casa para que seas bien querida. Así que vamos a utilizarla y lo vamos a bañar todos los días, martes y los días viernes. Una vez que lo has bañado, ¿cuál es el lugar perfecto para que él...? So she's basically doing a bathe in the Buddha ritual. Um, and so... Is that alcohol? No, it's agua florida. It's a flor, uh, flower water. Oh, that would have been great. Yeah. So while several students of mine have offered to translate the video for their peers, I actually do prefer to keep it in its original Spanish to better mimic a kind of ethnography experience. Um, and if I often have a student in the classroom who, is, who speaks Spanish fluently, and so they can kind of become an on-the-ground expert right there and do a translation for us. Um, so I do often pair this with a really cool reading. The last of my switch, I promise. So um, I often pair this with a reading called The Buddha and the Botanica from Africana scholar Yvonne Chiru's blog, Academic Voodoo. And in that article, she traces the history of the Buddha. Ah, there it goes. The history of the Buddha in this kind of Santeria tradition in Vado, back to Chinese indentured laborers who were brought to Cuba um, to work on sugarcane plantations. And it includes a lot of really cool images and material religion um, to devote to the Buddha from the Santeria tradition. So lucky Buddha floor wash. So I have a ball of that at home. You're supposed to put it on your floors to bring wealth in. Um, and her blog not only presents students with images of several material artifacts, like the lucky Buddha floor wash, um, but it also neatly sidesteps the entire discussion of is this Buddhism or not? And does this belong in a Buddhism classroom? Uh, one of the beautiful things about scholarship on Africana and Yoruba Vado religion is that no one is that one can enthusiastically, enthusiastically answer these questions, uh, both of them with "Who cares?" 
Uh, because these new world Creole religions were never elevated to the status of world religion, the academic obsession with origins and the, and the naive intellectual narrative of institutional, or popular, valid, or invalid, uh, real or unreal, never developed around them. It's all just stuff people do with a Buddha. And so this is where I want to end my presentation, by asking all of us to think about our own Buddhism classrooms with the same kind of flexibility and vigor. Maybe the classroom narrative of a Buddhist intellectual history beginning in India and spraying around the world through books and texts is not serving our students. Or maybe it served the type of students that we used to have. Um, and regardless, we must confront it and undermine its influence in an effort to be better educators for our increasingly diverse classrooms. Um, because just like the sutra narrative about the chain of blind Brahmins lean each other forward to further ignorance, it is not enough to simply do what has always been done. Rather, we must question if our pedagogies are appropriate, effective, and engaging for all of the students in our classrooms. So I hope I left a couple of little bit of time for questions and discussion. We'll see.